So we're going to start a new series today, which we often do after Easter. We are going to look at the book of Nehemiah. And I'm going to tell you right up front where this is going to go, what I'm kind of fascinated about with regard to the book of Nehemiah and the character of Nehemiah. And that is the vision that God places on Nehemiah's heart and then Nehemiah's obedience to that vision. Okay, the vision that God puts on Nehemiah's heart and Nehemiah's obedience to that vision, even through some ups and downs. And so that is where this series is headed, because I think that God places visions, God places concerns on many of us, and we don't always know what to do with them. This morning... We're going to focus on something a little bit different before we get into that vision stuff in later weeks, because I think we need to establish something. It's going to be important for us as we consider the visions that God places on our own hearts. Uh, This is going to be important for us to consider. And so this morning, not only do I want to set the stage of the entire book and the entire series, give you a little bit of background, but I also want to introduce you to this character, Nehemiah, okay? And I want to establish this morning that Nehemiah is a man of prayer. That's very important. It's provides a little bit of continuity from the series that we actually started the year with. So it's a good throwback to remind us the importance and the centrality that prayer should have in the Christian life, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So I invite you to turn to Nehemiah. We're going to start chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, I'm going to read the first chapter, and then we're going to get into the sermon a little bit, and then we're going to read eight verses into the second chapter uh, a little ways into the sermon. But it's a big chunk of reading, so I don't want to throw it all at you once. So Nehemiah 1, beginning at verse 1, is on page 750 in your pew Bibles if you want to follow along. Otherwise, it's going to be on the screen as well. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hands, O Lord. Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so Nehemiah walks onto the pages of Scripture as a man who was at the very top of his profession. The top of his profession, the cupbearer for the king. But we have no idea how he got there. We also have no idea where he was born. We have no idea about his upbringing. We do not know anything about his teenage years or or how he became the cupbearer to King 
Artaxerxes of Persia. Now, just to situate this in history, uh, the book of Nehemiah begins about 13 years after the book of Ezra ends. And so the year is about 445 B.C. And we are in a place called Susa. Susa. And he mentions the citadel. And it means the fortified city. Now, Susa was not the capital of the empire, but it was a very, very important place because it was the winter residence of the kings. And Susa is perhaps one of the most ancient cities in the world. It's about 150 miles east of the Tigris River, about 250 miles west of Babylon, and it is even today situated near the border of Iran. It had been captured by Cyrus around the time that the first exiles returned to Jerusalem, which would have been about 100 years before the time of Nehemiah. Susa was a pretty good-sized city. And the palace itself was just amazing, the palace at Susa. It was situated in the mountains, kind of overlooking the city. It had like 72 beautiful columns that were like 80 feet tall. So this is a pretty special place to live and, and to be. And so this is where we find Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, as I said, was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Now, we don't think about this all that much because we don't live really in the same times and in the same circumstances. And you think cupbearer and you think kind of lowly servant. And I don't think that we should think that way because uh, when you do think about it in context, being the cupbearer to the king was an extremely, extremely important job. Because the thing that Persian kings and others in the ancient world feared most was assassination by poisoning. And so when it came to appointing someone for a position like that, the king would appoint someone that he trusted implicitly, someone that he trusted up and down the line to serve in the role of cupbearer. Because whenever the king ate, multiple times a day, the cupbearer was there. Whenever he drank, multiple times a day, the cupbearer was there. And Nehemiah, a Jew, a foreigner, was chosen for that role. And that says something about Nehemiah's character right up front. It also says something, and we'll get into this in later weeks, it says something about how the Jews adapted to exile. Well, King Artaxerxes trusted Nehemiah with his life. And this is why. Because whenever a drink was served... Nehemiah would be the first one to drink from it. And then the king would wait for a few minutes to see whether Nehemiah started foaming at the mouth and keeled over and dropped on the floor. And if Nehemiah didn't, then the wine was safe to drink. So not only was it an important role, it was also kind of a, a risky role as well. And so in the coming weeks, we're going to talk a lot about Nehemiah's character, as I mentioned. It's a strong and temperamental character at times. It's going to make some of us happy and relate well. As a matter of fact, we're going to encounter an incident later in the book uh, when Nehemiah actually pulls out the hair of a certain individual because he's so angry. Now, I've never done that to anyone but myself, but uh, maybe that's something that some of you can relate to. Um, but as I mentioned, this morning I want to establish that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. And that's what I think is drawn out really, really well in that first chapter. This is one particular feature of Nehemiah, and there are several. But, but this is the one that is kind of foundational. It stands out. It shines above the others. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. So look at verse 2. Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. So this is kind of the verse that gets the plot moving, okay? It provides uh, some context, and it certainly provides context for Nehemiah's prayer that he prays a few verses later. 
Hanani might be a literal brother to Nehemiah, or he may be a brother in the sense that he was a fellow Jew. Commentators disagree on that. But either way, Hanani was part of a group that had traveled to Susa from Jerusalem. Now, Nehemiah had never been to Jerusalem. He had never seen the city. He had never seen the temple. But he probably did know some of the people who had left with Ezra 13 years before. And so he asked this group, he asked these guys all sorts of questions. Hey, how are the people in Jerusalem doing? How is, is the word of the Lord prospering? Tell me, about, tell me about the church. Is it healthy? Tell me about the leadership and the preaching of Ezra. Are God's people growing and thriving? He's excited to hear but the group answers in verse 3, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Bad news. Things are not going well. The walls of Jerusalem were a, a pile of rubble surrounding the city. The city gates were charred wreckage. And honestly, it had probably been this way for over 100 years because it was actually Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia who conquered Jerusalem in 587 B.C. Remember, we're in 445 right now. That happened in 587. Actually, in Ezra 4, we learn that, that there had been an attempt to, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem during his time, uh, and we learned that it was Artaxerxes, the guy that Nehemiah worked for, who had put a stop to it. And so God gets all of this information to Nehemiah, and God puts a burden on the heart of Nehemiah. He's concerned about the kingdom. He's concerned about the cause of God. And initially, we sense his frustration because he can't do anything about it. As we said, Nehemiah is the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. That's a very important job. He is not in a position to leave his post and, and just go off to Jerusalem for some extended period of time and try and put things right. And so what does he do? What does he do? The text says he mourned, and he fasted, and he prayed. Now from Nehemiah 1 verse 1 to Nehemiah 2 verse 1, which we're going to read in a few minutes, about four months go by, which means that Nehemiah engaged in diligent prayer for about four straight months. And his prayer is recorded and described in verse 5 to the end of chapter 1. He prayed while he was lying in his bed. He prayed while he was sitting down. He prayed while he was standing up. He prayed while he was doing his work. He prayed while he was serving the king. With regard to this situation that, that so burdened his heart, prayer was the only thing that he could do about it. But... It was everything that he could do about it. And that's important. There was nothing else he could do about it, but that was everything he could do. And so he did it. And I also want you to pay attention to this. I also want you to notice this. Um, it's not as though Nehemiah prayed as his last resort, okay? It's not like Nehemiah tried a bunch of things and, and did a bunch of things and tried to make a bunch of plans and they didn't work out. And then finally it was like, okay, God, well, I'm going to throw my hands up. I can't think of anything else to do, so I'm going to pray. No, it's not as though he prayed as if it was his last resort. Prayer is the first thing that Nehemiah did. Prayer is the first thing that Nehemiah did because it was the instinct of his heart. It was the uh, disposition of his redeemed nature to pour out his soul to God. And there are a couple things that I think we can learn from this. The first is just the patience and the diligence of Nehemiah. 
I mean, for four straight months, this guy engaged in prayer, whatever he was doing. Prayer was at the forefront of his mind. Prayer is what he was engaged in. Verse 6, part of his prayer, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. So over and over, Nehemiah is praying this prayer. And as I mentioned, it's the only thing that Nehemiah can do at this point. And so here he is praying, burdened in his heart, wanting desperately to do more. And I don't think it's far-fetched to think that his friends from Jerusalem had probably tried to persuade Nehemiah to come back with them. Hey, you would be a great asset to, to our people in Israel. You could, you could lend your expertise. You could, you could help us to rebuild. You could help us to fix this problem of shame and disgrace that we are suffering right now. Come on, Nehemiah, come with us. And perhaps Nehemiah initially responded, I, I, guys, I can't come. I can't come. I'm the cupbearer for goodness sake. How could I possibly come? I mean, if I were to come, something extraordinary would have to happen. Circumstances in my life would have to change drastically. Artaxerxes would have to die or, or go crazy and just let me go in order for me to be released from this position. <clears throat> and of course, Nehemiah, a servant, I mean, trusted though he was, did not feel that it was his place to mention any of this to King Artaxerxes, probably fearing that he would anger the king. Kings weren't the most emotionally and, and stable people imaginable back then. I don't know if they are now or not, but uh, they weren't back then. And so he was living in fear of Artaxerxes finding this out, at least for a time. And so Nehemiah prays, patience and diligence, not knowing, not understanding what his role would be in the future according to God's will. Yeah, whatever his desires might have been at the time, he had no idea how God was going to use him, but <clears throat> he continued to pray, continued to open himself up to God's will, continued to lay the concerns of his heart at the foot of God day and night for four months. Now, I don't know if we always trust this as much as we should, but God's timetable is perfect. He's never early. He's never late. When things happen in our lives, in this world, they happen right on schedule. This is part of the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, which we believe. And Nehemiah learns this lesson because he is patient and diligent in prayer. So the second thing I want to point out is the structure of Nehemiah's prayer. And this maybe has the most to do with uh, the series that we had in, in January and February. So this is kind of review. Let me just point this out. Verse 5. O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands... Why well, don't I just point out that Nehemiah begins his prayer with adoration. O oh Lord, God of heaven, great God, awesome God, faithful God, loving God, God of relationship. And brothers and sisters, it is always good to remind ourselves of who we are praying to. It is always good to remind ourselves of what God is like. It is always good to give him the glory that he deserves right from the start. Because see, uh, adoration, even standing alone, has a way of redeeming our perspective. Sometimes when I am very, very troubled and I go to God in prayer and I intentionally begin with adoration, look, God, I know who you are. You're amazing. You're the only person I can go to. By the time I'm done praising him with those three or four lines, I'm like, you know what? I already feel better. I already feel better because I just reminded myself who I'm praying to, someone who loves me, someone who's in control of my life, Someone who is always going to work for my greatest good. It's a good reminder. Redeems our perspective. 
Then we, verses six and seven. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. So Nehemiah's prayer begins with adoration and then moves quickly into confession of sin. So while adoration is a reminder of who God is, confession serves as a reminder of who we are. We confess the sins that we have committed against the God who created and redeemed us. We confess our wickedness and rebellion. We confess our disobedience to the guidelines and the boundaries that God has placed in our lives for our own good. And in doing so, brothers and sisters, acknowledging who God is and who we are, the grace and mercy and love of God for us can truly be understood and appreciated in deeper and deeper ways. Verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And so, After engaging in adoration to God and confession of sin, Nehemiah makes his request. See, Nehemiah is a little bit conflicted, right? Nehemiah is a strong believer. I mean, you can see that right up front in his prayer life. But Nehemiah is also concerned with staying on the good side of King Artaxerxes, okay? Because not only is Artaxerxes Nehemiah's boss, He's the most powerful man in Nehemiah's world. I mean, he could order life or death for Nehemiah in an instant, in a second. And so Nehemiah did not want to do anything that was going to jeopardize that relationship, okay? But at the same time, and I'm sure that this is an insight that he gained from God, Nehemiah understands that he is in an extraordinary, extraordinary position of influence with the king just like Esther was for those young people who are learning from Zach at youth group. Nehemiah is in an extraordinary position of influence with the king. So by the end of the first chapter, Nehemiah has prayed with patience and diligence. He could not yet conceive of how God was going to answer the prayer that he was praying, but he lifts up his cares and concerns to God and asks God to show mercy to remember his word, to remember his promises to his people, which brings us to chapter two. And I was smart enough to put a bookmark in for myself. The rest of you I would just invite to read on the screens if you've got it. We're going to read Nehemiah 2, verses 1 to 8, okay? In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. Brothers and sisters, what an extraordinary encouragement it is to see God answer prayer, to show mercy, to step in, 
to come to the aid of his people. But Nehemiah, as I was thinking about it, also teaches us to be careful what we pray for. Because in a way, God uses Nehemiah to answer the very prayer that he was praying. Somewhere between the months of March and April, the following year, circumstances came together in the providence of God. We're told at the beginning of verse 2 that the king was drinking wine. Um, Perhaps we're meant to understand that the king was in a good mood. We're told in a parenthetical remark a little bit later that the queen was sitting next to him. And perhaps, perhaps Nehemiah was waiting for just this opportunity when the king was in a really good mood, surrounded by loved ones, to, to kind, of, um, kind of put forth this little act. Or maybe it wasn't an act at all. Maybe it wasn't an act at all. Maybe he was just this troubled and this sad. But either way, whether it was an act of courage or whether it was an act of carelessness, the king notices. The king notices and he asks Nehemiah to explain himself, why do you look so sad? And Nehemiah was very afraid once it all went down. And so this is a tense moment. It's a very tense moment. Nehemiah is standing before Artaxerxes. Maybe he's got a cup in his hand ready to give him. He's about to offer it to the king. He looks sad, and the king puts him on the spot and says, hey, look, Nehemiah, what's going on? This is supposed to be a fun party, and you're, uh, you're bringing me down. I don't know what exactly he said. But what I do know, because of what we read in the text, is what Nehemiah does when the king puts him on the spot. What does it say he does? He doesn't answer the king right away. He prays because he has an instinct for prayer. And we need to understand that the reason why Nehemiah has an instinct for prayer in this critical moment is because Nehemiah lived a life of prayer, okay? By way of application, let's turn that around for a moment. If you're not praying, If you haven't developed the habit of regular disciplined prayer, then you cannot be sure in a moment of crisis that your instinct is going to be one of prayer. Just something to think about, right? Like when you have a close call on the highway, when somebody swerves in front of you and you've got to jerk the wheel, are the first words out of your mouth help God, or are the first words out of your mouth some sort of profanity that you wouldn't want to share? Just something to think about. And why is that important? Why do I bring it up? Well, I bring it up because of the second half of verse 8, okay? That last little phrase, that last little sentence in the entire passage, and because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. Nehemiah is a man of prayer, which meant that when the chips went down, when he found himself in a crisis situation, what was his go-to? It was prayer. And God answered that prayer. And what I love about that statement is not just that there was this answer to Nehemiah's prayer, it is that Nehemiah is concerned to give all the glory for the answer to that prayer to God. He says, it was all God. Yes, Nehemiah is the one who spoke. Nehemiah is the one who prayed. But he realizes, at least by the time he writes this account down, that it was the good and gracious hand of God that was upon him. And brothers and sisters, as we close out today and finish for today, I just want to say that that is how we are to live. That that is how we are to face each new day. That that is how we are to face each new week. That we are to face each new moment, whether it be a crisis moment or not. That we face each new moment of each new day, of each new week, in the sure and absolute certainty that no matter what the circumstances, God is present, and that God's hand is upon us. And that's where we're going to close for today. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer.